All right, so this is section 11.2. This will be a multi-day, multi-video lesson. We'll start off with 11.2, day one. We're going to start talking about the idea of series. In our first video here, we're actually going to cover how sequences and series are similar and how they're different and how sequences basically get us to the idea of a series. And then in the second video um, for day one, we'll talk about the geometric series and in our third, um, excuse me, our day two videos, we'll actually get into um, this thing, which is called the nth term for di nth term test for divergence. Okay, so let's talk about what we learned a little bit in 11.1, .1, that a sequence is just a list. So a sequence is a list of numbers based upon some defining rule. And that's what we spent 11.1 .1 talking about. Well, the difference between that and a series is that a series takes that list of numbers and adds them together. So a series is a sum. Okay, that's the, in general, that is the easiest way to think about it. A sequence is a list of numbers. A series takes that list of numbers and adds them up. All right, so let's, um, and it does say, unless specifically told otherwise, we're going to assume that n equals 1 generates the first term of a sequence. Okay, we did talk about that last time as well. Um, <clears throat> let's kind of recap the idea of the sequence. So in these first couple examples, we're just listing the first five terms of the sequence. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm assuming that we can all plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 into these things and get values. So when you do so, the first one should give us values of 2, 5, 10, 17, and 26. And then the second one, because we have that alternating term, that negative 1 to the n minus 1 power up there, should give us 1 half, negative 1 fourth, 1 sixth, negative 1 eighth, one tenth, and I guess I have six on this one, so negative one twelfth. And you can see the alternating pattern there. Um, one of the big things to remember is that when we plug in one into the um, n in the numerator, that gives you negative one to the zero power. Remember, any number to the zero power is one, so that would be a positive value. All right, definition <clears throat> a sequence a sub n has a limit l, and we write the limit as and approaches infinity of a, um, that should be a sub n. Yeah, that is a typo. Those should be a sub n's, not a to the n. And that goes down here as well. Because <coughs> um, those are the terms of the sequence. So again, if you take the limit as n goes to infinity of the terms of the sequence and it approaches some finite value, then we call that value L, and that is the limit of the sequence. And if it has a limit, then the sequence converges. Otherwise, we say that the sequence diverges. Okay, again, that's a recap from what we did before. So let's go ahead and do a couple of quick examples, um, just to recap of what we did. So if we want to find out whether the sequence here converges or diverges, what you do is you take the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared over e to the n, and we're going to determine whether this has a limit or doesn't have a limit. And if it does have a limit, then it converges. Um, there is an easy way to determine this from this particular piece right here. And this has to do with the growth rates of the function. So the function on top is polynomial. The function on the bottom is exponential. An exponential function is always going to grow faster than a polynomial. So um, we know that the denominator will grow faster than the numerator in this case. And if that's the case, then this limit is going to approach zero. The other way to figure this out would be to change the func change the n's to a function of x, rewrite it, use L'Hopital's rule a couple of times, and you would still end up with zero. Um, 
but hopefully we all understand that the growth rate here on the denominator is going to be much bigger than the growth rate of the numerator as n starts to get sufficiently large. So that's why we have zero there. And therefore we would say that this series converges. Um, the one on the bottom, the second example here, is not quite as easy to just look at and see. Uh, does the sequence of the square root of n over the natural log of n converge? If you think about the graphs of those things, they look very similar, especially early on. It's not until you get much, much, much later into um, the graph as the graph goes further and further out in the x direction, or in this case, the n direction. So this one, you might actually want to go ahead and create the function, and we'll actually um, use our idea here. So the limit as x goes to infinity of the square root of x over the natural log of x, the numerator is um, going to approach infinity. The denominator, natural log of x, also approaches infinity. They both approach infinity at a relatively slow rate but you do get infinity on, over top of infinity. So we're going to use L'Hopital's rule here. Let's put an apostrophe H there, so we're using L'Hopital's rule. We'll take the derivative of the top, which is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And the derivative of the denominator is 1 over x. Now, you could try plugging infinity or relatively large, infinitely big numbers into the numerator and denominator, and you're going to get the same issue here. This is why we have to simplify first. So we're going to simplify. We'll bring that denominator up to the top and flip it over, multiply it, multiplying by the reciprocal. So we're going to get 1 half x to the negative 1 half times x to the first power just gives you x to the 1 half power, or the square root of x, and the limit of um, 1 half square root of x as x goes to infinity is infinite. Therefore, this one would be divergent because it is not infinity is not a finite number. It's not a number at all. It's a concept. Um, so that takes care of those first two. So what that told us is that numerator, even though it's a square root function, it's still some kind of a power function. Power functions will grow faster than natural log functions in general. So um, that's also something to keep in mind. We will talk much more about these growth rates as we go further and further. An infinite series, or just known as a series, is simply the terms of the sequence added up, and it is written <clears throat> using the summation notation, which we probably haven't seen um, a lot of um, since Riemann sums, maybe, a long time ago when we were adding up Riemann sums. Um, in order to determine this, we're going to start off with doing some finite series, so we see how they work. So let's evaluate the finite series as n goes from 0 to 7 of cosine of pi n over 2. So if I want to add up a finite series, I simply add up all the terms and starting with 0 and adding up to the 7th term, and we're going to see what we get. So if you plug in 0 for n, you get cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. If you plug in 1 for n, you're going to get cosine of pi halves. Cosine of pi halves is 0. So let's write this down. This is the first, oh, sorry, this is the zeroth term, first term. Put this in parentheses so we know what we're doing here. Um, so as we go to the second term, the second term cosine of 2 pi over 2 is cosine of pi. That's negative 1. So we'll subtract 1 there. The third term, if we plug in 3, we get cosine of 3 pi halves. That's also 0. Fourth term, cosine of 2 pi is back to positive 1. Again, hopefully you can see the pattern here. The fifth term is going to be zero. The sixth term is going to be negative one. The seventh term is going to be zero. So if we add all these things up, one minus one, one minus one, we get zero. So the sum of that finite series, kind of unremarkable there, is zero for those first seven terms. Right, hopefully that makes sense. 
We're going to do one more finite series. We're going to kind of um, come back to that idea of the factorial because, again, that's going to be an important concept throughout this specific chapter. This is a very long chapter. All right, so we've got, in this case, only four terms to add up as n goes from 1 to 4. So let's start off with the first one. If we plug in 1, so we're going to, this will be our first term. If we plug in 1, we're going to get 0 factorial on the numerator. Remember, 0 factorial is defined to be 1. And then 1 in the denominator, 1 squared is also 1. So our first term is 1. The second one, if we plug in 2, we're going to get 1 factorial on top. 1 factorial is also 1. And in the bottom, 2 squared is going to be 4 plus. <clears throat> if we plug in um, 3, we're going to get 2 factorial on the top, which is 2 times 1, so that's 2. And in the bottom, we're going to get 3 squared, which is 9. And then the last one, if we plug in 4, we're going to get 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. And 4 in the denominator is 16. <clears throat> so then if we add all those things up, I'm not going to, oops, that's the second term, third term, fourth term. Um, I'm not going to take the time to go through the process here. You have to find your common denominator, which in this case is um, 72. And I believe the numerators add up to 133 um, to add all that stuff up. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what you would get for finite sums. Okay, so the reason that that's important is because we can start this idea of a partial sum. A partial sum, it's denoted by S sub N, and the reason that this is considered a partial sum is because n would have to be some kind of a finite value. And if that's the case, you can add up the first so many terms of an infinite series. All right, sorry about that partial interruption there of the uh, telephone in the background. Robocallers have no respect for when you're trying to create a video at home. You know, they don't know any different. So um, anyway, so if... We're, the idea behind this partial sum is that we can add up the first so many terms of a sequence, and that'll give us a partial sum of a series, because the series is infinite itself. Um, but if we want to add up the first so many terms, we call it a partial sum. So the idea is, if I want to take the sum of the first term, a partial sum of one, well, that's literally just the first term of the sequence, so it's not really a sum, it's just the first term. If I want to take S sub 2, Wow, I guess uh, recording a video at 1.20 in the afternoon is not the appropriate time. My phone has not been ringing all day, and now it's ringing like back-to-back. -back. Again, apologies. Um, <clears throat> so where was I at? I was at S sub 2. So this one right here means you're going to add up the first two terms of the sequence to get your series of, excuse me, sequence of partial sums of two terms. S sub 3, you add up the first three terms, and so on, all the way up until you get to S sub n, which means add up the first n terms of the sequence. Uh, where this is really going to come into play is where you don't necessarily know what n is, and we have to figure that out, but we'll get to that. So in our first example, and this is pretty straightforward, you want to identify the first five terms of the sequence of partial sums for the infinite series. So you can see that the series is infinite because it has n equals 1 to infinity for the sum. And then you've got your general term n, n, n minus 2. So if I want to find the sequence of partial sums, in this case we want to identify the first five of them. First five terms of the sequence of partial sums means I need S sub 1, S sub 2, S sub 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> and what you're going to get is you're going to get a sum for each one of these things. And what the answers create is a sequence. It's a list of numbers of the answers of these sums. So let's show what that means. So S sub 1, that's the easy one. That's just literally taking the first term. If I plug in 1... I'm plugging in 1 for each one of the ends. We get 1 times negative 1, so that's negative 1. 
if I plug in, um, or if I want to find S sub 2, I've got to add up the first two terms, which is going to be negative 1 plus, if I plug in 2, we get 0. So that's adding the first two terms, which will still give us negative 1. If I want to find S sub 3, that's going to be adding the first three terms. Well, we already have the first two terms, negative 1 plus 0. And then if I plug in 3, we're going to get 3 times 1, which is 3. So we add those up and we get, oops, that's not negative 2, that's positive 2, 2. S sub 4, taking those first three terms and then adding the fourth one to it because it's the first four terms. So if I plug in 4, we'll get 4 times 2, which is 8, which gives us 10. And then S sub 5, taking those first four terms that we had there, adding the fifth one. And if we plug in 5, we get 5 times 3, so we get 15 which is 25. So now hopefully what you could see is, did I have to write out all first four of those terms? Not really, because what you can see, I'll just use this last one as an example, this right here, those first four terms, we already figured out what that was. That was this 10 right here. So then you just literally add the next term to it and get to that 25. The sequence of partial sums would be, if I wanted to write this, the sequence would be negative 1, negative 1, 2, 10, 25. And obviously these would keep going, but they only asked us for the first five. If I wanted to write this as an actual infinite sequence, I would use dot, 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 and then whatever the defining thing was for this. But for this purpose, they only asked us for the first five. So that's what that created, all of these recreate the sequence of the partial sums. And we'll get to see that if there's a pattern here, um, then that pattern is going to be useful. All right. Same exact idea here. Let's identify the first five terms of the sequence of partial sums for the infinite series. So let's go ahead and write those out. S sub 1, S sub 2, 3, 4, and 5. <clears throat> so S sub 1 is literally just the first one. Now, keep in mind here, it's not when you're always plugging in 1. You have to be very cognizant of where your sum starts. In this case, our sum starts at 0. So it's what we get when we plug in 0. Plugging in 0 is going to give us 2 times 1 third to the 0. 1 third to the 0 is 1, so 2 times 1 is 2. <clears throat> okay, the second one is 2 plus the next term. If I plug in 1, I'm going to get 2 times 1 third, which is 1 third. Adding that up, I'm sorry, that's not 1 third, it's 2 thirds. Excuse me. Um, 2 times 2 thirds should be 8 thirds. Not 2 times 2 plus, 2 thirds, excuse me, should be 8 thirds. So then I'm going to bring that 8 thirds down here. So I don't have to rewrite every single term. Then we'll plug in, we're at n equals 2 now. n equals 2 is going to give us 2 times 1 ninth, so that's 2 ninths. <clears throat> 2 ninths, all in terms of, terms of ninths, 24, 26 ninths. So we'll bring 26 ninths down here. Plugging in n equals 3 is 1 over 27 times 2, so that's 2 over 27. Numbers are going to start getting a little bigger here. In terms of 27, we'll multiply the 26 ninths by 3 over 3. And that's going to give us 78, 70, no, 80 20 sevenths. And then the last one will bring 80 20 sevenths down. <clears throat> Plugging in 4, we are going to get 2 times 1 over 81, so 2 over 81. And to change those in terms of 80 first, we'll have to multiply 27 times 3. So we get 240 on the top, 242 when you add them both together over um, 81, excuse me. So our sequence of partial sums is 2, 8 thirds, 26 ninths, 80 over 27, 242 over 81, and if you can kind of see what the pattern is doing there, this is going to help 
hopefully you can see that these numbers are getting closer and closer and closer the further we go out here to three. So that sequence of partial sums is actually approaching a specific value. And that will be important um, when we get to um, the geometric uh, the geometric series portion, which is going to be in our next video. All right. Hopefully, again, you can see that that is what ha what is happening here. All right. So what does all that stuff mean? How is that going to help? Well, we have a definition here. Given a series, n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n equals a sub 1, a sub plus a sub 2, plus a sub 3, all the way up to the nth term, that's going to equal your partial sum, and that will be S sub N. And that's going to be denoted by starting with some value um, and adding all the numbers, up, all the terms of the sequence up until we get to the nth term. If the sequence S sub N is convergent, so like we just showed in the previous example, it looks like this thing is converging to a value. If it is convergent, the limit as n approaches infinity of s sub n will equal the sum, s. And if that's the case, then that's going to mean it exists and it's a real number. You can't have a sum be infinite. Then the series is called convergent, and we would write the series as all of the terms up to the nth term plus all the rest of the terms, which is what this part here has to say, and that's going to equal our sum, s. So then we would say that the sum from 1 to infinity of a sub n is s, whatever that sum is that we just came up with. <clears throat> the number s is called the sum of the series. Otherwise, the series is called divergent. So if it does not have a sum, it would be called divergent. So let's kind of break that down into what that just meant. If I were to take an infinite number of terms and add them up, it's telling me that I can actually have a finite sum. And the way you could determine that is to take the limit as S sub n, which is the sequence of partial sums up to a certain point n, and then take the limit of that sum as n goes to infinity. And if that is a finite value, then that limit is the sum of the infinite number of terms added together. One of the biggest questions that people ask is how can you possibly have an infinite number of terms, infinite number of numbers added up, and it still equals a finite value? How is that possible? How can I keep adding numbers together and have it actually equal a finite number? The easiest way to show this um, graphically is to create a box. Now, for purposes of what we're doing here, we're going to make this a relatively simple box. We are going to say that this box has a length and a height of 1, which, of course, we know that the area of that box then is going to be 1. Well, what if I were to take that box and split it in half? Well, that means this side over here is a half, and then the other side on the, other, on the, on the right side is also a half. But what if I take that right side half and split it into half again? Well, that means that this is going to be one-fourth of the box, while the bottom part is going to be another one-fourth of the box. What if I take that bottom part of the box and I split it in half again? Then that means this part right here is an eighth of the box, and the other half of that is the eighth of the box. Split it in half again, this would be one-sixteenth of the box, and so on. I can keep splitting this remaining box into halves and keep adding up all of the numbers. Eventually, even though I can keep infinitely splitting these things in half, the remaining boxes in half, I am still adding up an infinite number of numbers because you should be able to agree mathematically we can keep splitting something in half. Okay, mathematically it'll get very small, but we can keep doing it. And if I add up all of the numbers, they have to add up to the area of that box, which is 1. So there is a way to add an infinite number of things and actually get a finite number. All right, I think that is plenty enough for this video. We have kind of started to develop the idea behind a geometric sequence series here with this um, box idea. We'll come back in the second video, um, go more into geometric series, and do some examples.